So without further ado, I'm uh, really pleased to introduce uh, the General Secretary of CND, Dr. Kate Hudson, um, on how the review impacts Britain's nuclear weapons policy. Thanks very much, Ellie, and thanks to Greater Manchester and District CND for inviting me. Um, very, very topical subject, obviously, and, and absolutely crucial. Um, so I think um, over the past few years, we've had this heard this term global Britain bandied around a lot. Of course, it was a bit of a Boris Johnson slogan uh, around the time of Brexit and afterwards. And, not, you know, I think a lot of us probably thought, well, what does he actually mean? Because global Britain could be a good thing. You know, it could be being part of the global community, being a... Uh, you know, good citizen in global terms and all that sort of thing. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, what it actually means has now been spelt out very clearly in the integrated review, the government's integrated review, uh, which Ellie has just referred to. And um, I've had the pleasure or non-pleasure really of reading the whole thing through and um, the word that struck me very forcibly was basically attack. So in Johnson's terms, I think that global Britain means Britain on the attack. Um, the document is all about projecting force globally and all, all three of us speakers are going to talk about different elements of that. Um, but there are some kind of overarching themes, um, one of which, um, one expression which uh, struck me very forcefully was the, the statement that Britain is ready to deter and to defeat if necessary. So it's all kind of bigging up the idea we need to go to war, so be it, and so on. And I suppose the other thing that struck me quite hard was really how it was a bit like a kind of Trumpian type thing, you know, so I guess that maybe it had been written and put together and conceptualized while while Trump was still president. And there's a lot in it which is reminiscent of his strategies and his postures and so on. So, for example, it talks about defending democracy against systemic competition, shaping a new open international order and so on. So very much the the US narrative. It also talks a lot about Britain being Western Europe's most heavily armed nation, its leadership role in NATO and so on. And also quite a bit about uh, Britain being really firmly US junior partner. So from CND point of view, um, in particular, um, I think obviously the most shocking part was about the, the nuclear, the changes in nuclear policy. I don't think anyone was expecting this. Um, I think, you know, I thought, well, they've, they've put a lot of extra money out there, but there's no indication there's going to be a change in policy around nukes. I thought it would just be carry on with the replacement. But no, uh, really, really significant changes. Um, the first one is the uh, decision to increase the uh, nuclear arsenal. That's our uh, nuclear warhead stockpile by 40%. So that's from around, I think we're supposed to have about 195 at the moment. We're supposed to be going down to 180, going up to 260. Um, and this is very significant. It reverses three decades of gradual reductions in the UK's nuclear arsenal. Those of you who've kind of followed this will know that, you know, the number has been steadily going down. In the late 90s, we moved from having you know, two or three different um, sy delivery systems to just having the submarine based system. So it was kind of looking as though we were uh, going down. Um, in 20, 2010, the uh, Conservative led coalition government uh, announced it was going to re reduce the stockpile further to 180. You know, so it was, you know, it was a kind of all party thing, all party government thing going down. Now that has been reversed. That uh, decades of glad gradual reductions has just been reversed. It's ended. Um, and interestingly, it, it goes against the approach taken by other countries. Um, so just earlier this year, just before this was announced, Presidents Biden and Putin, they renewed the New START Treaty, that's a bilateral nuclear weapons reduction treaty, it was one of the first things Biden did when he came into office. So 
it's like they're on the reductions path still, but Britain is unilaterally starting a new nuclear arms race. Now, of course, there was immediately uproar and outrage, quite rightly. Um, the Secretary General of the UN said that it broke our uh, NPT obligations. So um, we asked CND, we asked two very eminent lawyers at the LSE to uh, provide a legal opinion, um, which actually we launched yesterday. And um, I suppose it's, it's no surprise um, to know that this uh, increase in warhead numbers does uh, break international law because it breaches the NPT obligations. And, and that's very clearly set out. If you haven't seen it or you didn't come to the launch yesterday, you can access that on the website. And um, it, it's really interesting. I mean, it goes into uh, a lot of detail, but it's it's uh, quite accessible detail. And it really goes into all the elements of the law, how it breaks humanitarian law and um, all kinds of different things, including the impacts on um, uh, women and girls being more um, strong impacts than on men and all that kind of thing. And, and loads of things that I hadn't even thought about. So that's really, really worth um, looking at. Um, so that was launched yesterday and we had pretty good coverage of it, including in The Guardian, which doesn't always um, take an interest in nuclear matters, unfortunately. Um, but then that, that wasn't the only bad thing about the integrated review, not the only change um, in nuclear policy. Um, it also includes a change in the use posture, uh, that's to say, um, under what circumstances will nuclear weapons be used. So Britain now reserves the right to use or threaten to use nuclear weapons, not only against nuclear threats, but also against supposedly comparable threats, such as chemical and biological weapons or emerging technologies. Um, so when people talk about emerging technologies, they usually talking about things like cyber attack and so on. So you have to wonder, how can you nuke a cyber attack? I mean, it's just completely bonkers. Um, and also the whole old narrative, you know, you have nuclear weapons in order not to use them. You know, we've all heard politicians say that. Well, now they're talking about using them and using them in non-nuclear circumstances. So really, really disastrous policy change. And then the other thing, Ellie, if I've just got time to quickly mention it, um, the additional change is an end to uh, Britain's um, much vaunted policy, vaunted by our government, I should say, not really by anybody else, their transparency on nuclear weapons. If you ever uh, used to go to NPT conferences and all that sort of thing, they'd always be saying, oh, we're the good boys, as they would call themselves. Um, you know, we we you know ex we talk about the figures. We let people know what we're doing, how much we've got, and all that. Finished. That's all over. And they've extended their policy of so-called deliberate ambiguity, and they won't give public figures anymore. So we won't even know if they've increased the um, warheads in the way they say they're going to. So that's that's it really. And the final uh, mention really. Some of you may remember the Tutatis Agreement with France. This was, was it a decade ago or something, um, where, where Britain and France cooperate on nuclear weapons testing simulations. That will continue. That's Aldermast and then Valduc, I think it is in France. That's carrying on. And they've also announced that the US-UK Mutual Defence Agreement, the world's most extensive nuclear sharing agreement, that will be renewed. Um, and that's going to take place in Parliament in 2024. That's another thing for us to have on our calendar going forward of things we've got to object to and try and stop. Um, so, Ellie, I think that's probably it from me. I think I've hopefully just um, rounded those things up clearly. So, back to you. And the time as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah thank you thank you for that incredibly incredibly interesting points and yeah a lot a lot to keep on our mind I'm sure um but with that in mind if you do have any questions for Kate please do pop them in the Q&A section um, and we'll be answering those after our next speaker 
which brings me to Dr. Jenny Clegg, um, who's a member of CND Council as well as CND's International Advisory Group. Uh, additionally, Jenny is an active member of Greater Manchester CND and Stop the Wall Coalition and is here to explain the UK's relationship with China um, and Britain's provocative plans uh, within the review. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Ellie. Um, I was actually going to talk about the uh, aircraft carrier, um, which is setting off uh, on its maiden voyage heading towards the South China Sea um, in a couple of days' time. Um, this journey um, is symbolic of the future direction of Britain for the coming decades, as set out in the integrated review, showing that a global Britain is military led and directed towards the Indo Pacific region. Uh, this direction takes on a particular significance in the new international scenario of Cold War with China. And so I'll just say a few words about the aircraft carrier and then talk uh, more about the strategic um, context. Um, so um, the uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, aircraft carrier strike group is said to be the biggest military and aerial deployment since the Falklands War in 1982. The aircraft carrier itself is absolutely massive. Um, its flight deck is about four acres. Um, it's going to be accompanied by three destroyers, one of which is American, uh, plus two frigates and a nuclear submarine armed with a Tomahawk missile. Um, it will be carrying 18 F-35 fighter jets. It's got room for a lot more. Uh, but anyway, 10 of these uh, are actually American. So this whole operation is costing billions. Um, there are two aircraft carriers and together they cost um, over uh, six billion pounds. The F-35, so far another billion. Uh, we're supposed to buy 138 F-35s in total. That'll be an additional 13 billion. There are 1,700 personnel on the aircraft carrier uh, and the running costs alone amount to 15% of the defence budget, 1,5%. The route um, goes through the Mediterranean, the Suez Canal, the Gulf, round India, up through the Malacca Straits in Southeast Asia, through the South China Sea, passing numbers of trouble spots on the way. Uh, it is to visit 90 ports in 40 different countries. That's more than a fifth of the world's nations. Many of these, indeed most, are former colonies. And the aim is to rebuild historical and military relations so as to push these countries to line up with the new militarist Cold War agenda. In each locality and region, the aircraft carrier will serve as a focal point for joint military manoeuvres. There's an arms sales element here, as well as uh, a military industrial uh, linkages with BAE systems jointly building fighter jets with Japan and with South Korea. The military maneuver in the South China Sea, together with the US and probably others, possibly even Japan, um, will be highly provocative and dangerous. These waters are teeming with all sorts of warships, coast guards, fishing boats, it, they're a tinderbox and the risks of accident um, are, are very high, which could escalate into war um, since the atmosphere is such that it's very hard uh, for any side to back down. And the question is, how will China react to this? Uh, now, just to uh, elaborate a little bit on, uh, on global Britain, you know, as, as Kate mentioned, following Brexit, uh, Johnson promised Britain's return to its rightful place as an independent power leading the world. Indeed, the idea of British independence was the premise of Brexit, but nothing could be further from the truth. Our new Asia uh, Indo-Pacific tilt joins us into the US hostile competition with China, as demonstrated by the fact that we're carrying more US fighter jets than we are British. Um, so in the integrated review, it says Russia is a serious and acute threat, but the review itself is clearly directed at China with its Indo-Pacific tilt. China is mentioned three times more than Russia, and this is the first time we've had a review like this, which is comprehensive. That's including uh, economic policy, foreign policy, as well as defense policy, and China is seen as a systemic competitor, challenging our prosperity, security, and values. 
Now, on the question of the uh, Asia Pacific, uh, on the question of the Indo Pacific, so we're familiar with Obama's Asia Pacific pivot, but less well known is that Trump pursued the idea of the Quad, which is short for the uh, Quadrilateral Security Dialogue made up of Australia, the US, Japan and India. Uh, this was primarily aimed at bringing a non-aligned India into a military relationship with the West. Uh, now Biden, within his hundred, first hundred days of office, has elevated the Quad to a heads of state meeting, making it a priority, and so far succeeding in involving Japan in military drills. So just a few words on Biden. So far, he has not changed Trump's key policies on China and is even stepping up the action, sending warships into the Taiwan Straits. And he's also taking a more ideological approach um, focused on values. His emphasis on diplomacy and multilateralism, which is where he differs from Trump, is rather selective and is directed mainly at allies. So what's going on here? Trump's American approach of, uh, Trump's America first approach um, is seen to have failed. China clearly was able to, un to withstand the pressure. So now the US establishment has realized it cannot win against China alone. Hardline cold warriors in the US are calling on key allies to form a single economic, technological and military bloc so as to exert enough pressure on China to bring it to heel subordinate to US leadership. Biden now calls for a summit of democracies to stand against authoritarian regimes. It's still an America first approach since he prioritizes, since he pressurizes countries to sign up to US prioritized priorities and share the costs of the US military agenda. So back to the aircraft carrier. Um, under the integrated review, we're really subcontracting our increased military resources out to the US allowing the Americans to shift their nuclear warheads and another aircraft carrier from NATO to the Indo-Pacific Command. The aircraft carrier voyage is to declare Britain is back as a military and diplomatic presence, but its purpose as it travels through Asia, the Middle East, Southeast Asia and East Asia, is to deliver the agenda of the US warlords for Cold War division. In the Middle East, um, Britain has numbers of bases and special docking facilities have been built in Oman for the aircraft carrier, uh, bolstering Britain's regional uh, military presence and giving backing to the Gulf states as well as Israel. In this way, Britain will be supporting US efforts to stabilize the region, uniting the Gulf states and Israel whilst isolating the Palestinians. As we see, this isn't working very well, but the idea of stabilization is to allow the US to focus on China. Then India under Modi is drawing closer to the US and the UK aims to assist this. Uh, at a webinar yesterday, I heard someone from the uh, International Institute of Security uh, Studies uh, talking about how the UK might insert itself into the dialogue between India and China, taking up issues, for example, he listed Afghanistan, nuclear deterrence, vaccines, disaster relief, and the protection of sea lanes. So trying to influence uh, India's policy against, uh, to turn it against China. Uh, and in Southeast Asia, the US has long harbored harbored plans for a regional alliance structure similar to and joined into NATO. This has been resisted so far, but now the aircraft carrier will provide a focus and give backbone to multilateral military exercises planned with Singapore, Malaysia, Australia and New Zealand together. The particular goal uh, of, the, uh, of this Indo-Pacific tilt, reaching from the Middle East to tighten encirclement of China is Japan, with Britain aiming to renew uh, its military alliance. Now the UK-Japan military alliance has historical significance since it oversaw Japan's emergence as a military state in the early 20th century. And now Britain is again encouraging the Japanese military to take an overseas role, breaking uh, with Article 9 of the Japanese constitution, the peace clause. So just if I got a, a, another couple of moments to finish off, um, you know, we can say that the uh, Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier and the idea of a global Britain um, is um, an imperial vanity. 
uh, a delusional fantasy singing the tune of right-wing nationalism, but it's also a reality in fermenting Cold War division, which can only obstruct efforts to tackle the real security threats that we face, such as climate change, inequality, the pandemic, as we saw was nearly the case with the vaccine and the TRIPS waiver. A new Cold War will cement the idea of nuclear so-called deterrence against an enemy and will lead to further unraveling of the arms control system. Global Britain is a Britain of warlords. We must take our stand for another Britain, a Britain for people, for the planet, for peace, equality and justice. Thanks. Thank you for that, Jenny. That's some really powerful, powerful close in there. Um, right, so we're now going to turn our attention to the questions. If anyone has any, please do send them in. Um, so, yeah, for the next 10 minutes, we have a bit of a chance to discuss what we've just heard, um, as well as anything else that you think might be relevant. So please do pop any questions in there. Um, but I suppose maybe a good a good place to start firstly, uh, after that very powerful close from, from Jenny would be if people are kind of empowered and feeling like they want to do something, um, what would be the first the best steps people to take? So maybe maybe Kate, um, what is it that the ND are offering? What 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 can people do, whether that's this evening or protests to attend or something, if they feel inspired to to take action? Okay, well, the first thing I'm going to suggest, I've just put it in the, the chat uh, line there, which is the link to the legal opinion. So if you haven't already seen that, um, please do, please do read it. And, and um, on the website, homepage of the website, you can also um, look at the actual launch event yesterday with these two fabulous women, top legal experts, you know, who were, who were um, explaining it all. So there's, there are a couple of things really that have, have come out of this. Uh, well, there's many things. I won't say some of them because I know Jenny's going to talk about those um, stuff around the aircraft carrier. Um, but there are two particular things. Um, one is um, around the spending question, um, because when when this was first announced, you know, this obviously they didn't give figures for the money about what's, what this extra extra nuclear arsenal is going to cost. Um, but it's obviously going to be tens of billions, something like that. And it came just after Boris Johnson had said, oh, sorry, we can only afford 1% for nurses. And I'm sure everyone saw the um, graffiti and everything, which said nurses 1%, nukes 44% or whatever. So... Um, that is that really sums it up, I think, better than you know any great big long leaf or briefing or anything like that. So we have um, produced nurses not nukes T-shirts, um, which I think I'm not sure they were delivered in the office today. Yes, I was in the office today, um, or whether you know, but they're imminent basically. And we've also got new leaflets, nurses not nukes leaflet, which explain that side of it. So in terms of getting it out to uh, people in our communities get it's a, like a bit like a con continuity of the NHS not driving messaging obviously um, so that's there those are available um, for anyone who's um, around in London on the 26th of June we're going to have a nurses not nukes block on the people's assembly march and obviously um, everyone knows a nurse or a has a hospital nearby, you know, so I'm sure loads of local groups are going to be doing nurses not nukes activity on that day as well. So there's that really raising awareness about the government's wrong priorities. And then the other thing is directly related to, um, to the legal aspect, um, the, the illegality of the warhead increase. So uh, we've already had the letter writing campaign to Boris Johnson, which thousands and thousands of people have done that, you know, writing to him to object. But now we've got this definitive legal ruling on the illegality. We're going to start a campaign to get people to report the UK to the UN for their breaking of international law. Um, so the NPT review conference is coming up this summer. It's 
been rescheduled. It's supposed to be taking place now in August. So we're going to be taking or sending whatever all these letters of complaint and reportage um, to the people there at the MPT in the UN. So to report our government for breaking international law. So I think that that'd be quite a quite a nice thing to do. And we're also appealing to our international contacts in all the different organizations we work with internationally to get them to uh, write to the government and object to. Again, Sikia, the big Japanese anti-nuclear organization has already written to Boris Johnson. So we're trying to get a bit of an international head of steam up because this is obviously not just a British problem, it's an international problem too. Thank you. Uh, we do actually have a couple of questions have come in. Um, so one question uh, to Jenny uh, is, could you expand on the idea of the, the arms sale element of the, the aircraft carrier plans? Um, right, okay, I, I don't actually have any details on, on the arms sales, no doubt uh, this will transpire. Uh, this, this journey is actually going to take 28 weeks, so that's going to take us through to more or less the end of the year. But I mean, it's carrying an awful lot of, um, uh, as they like to say, state-of-the-art equipment, apart from the F-35s, um, uh, the different missiles, um, helicopters, um, surveillance equipment. Um, and uh, as I said, the, uh, the, the idea of building military links is also to integrate uh, uh, not only the, the different militaries together, but also the uh, military industrial industries uh, together. So if you like globalizing the um, uh, military industries. Um, I, do, I actually was going to say something about campaigning because uh, CND is campaigning together with uh, Stop the War uh, uh, against the aircraft carrier. Um, which it, at the moment it's um, carrying out exercises. I don't know whether people have seen reports. It's been, it's supposed to be a national secret. They're carrying out exercises uh, with all sorts of forces off the northwest coast of Scotland. And apparently uh, Scottish CND members have been trying to uh, draw attention to this and get some uh, protest uh, in, uh, in the press. Um, in Portsmouth, um, where the aircraft carrier is due to sail from in a couple of days, uh, there are also some people down there that are going to be organising a protest. Um, obviously, we've been overtaken by um, other events with um, uh, Palestine um, and the atrocities being carried out uh, by the Israelis. Um, so there are massive campaigns around that. Um, but we will be following the route um, of the aircraft carrier uh, and uh, no doubt in particular when it gets into the South China Sea. As I say, we don't know how the Chinese are going to react. Um, I mean, if, the rea rea if they react tit for tat, which they have been tending to do, will that mean sending aircraft carriers up through, uh, uh, up through the English Channel? <laughs> um, so if they, if they did something like that, then you know, clearly uh, all hell would break loose. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, we've got one, one more question has, has come in, which we can get answered before we move on to Dave, um, which is, has, has the integrated review been debated and voted on in Parliament? Um, if not, who, who, is the, who decides this? Okay, no, it hasn't been, and it won't be. Well, I mean, it has been in the sense that um, Prime Minister announced it and people made a few outrage and so on remarks, but it's not required to be voted on, it's government policy, so people can't um, vote it down. Jenny? Yeah, I mean, the, I, one thing that, uh, that uh, I think is we should take particular note of is the fact that it was voted on before it was actually put to Parliament because the MPs back in December voted blind to increase uh, the military spending uh, that supports this. They didn't barely knew what they were voting for, something vaguely said about, about space and that. Um, 
And uh, so it was all it was all done and dusted by Parliament before they actually spelt out what the plans were. Um, and I also wanted to say something about uh, Kate talking about the, um, uh, you know, calling on the uh, British government to uphold international uh, treaties and the rules based order. The whole point about Britain's global role in the aircraft carrier is to uphold the rules based order, which they claim that China is breaking uh, in the South China Sea. And they just quite uh, in, uh, with insouciance, if that's the right word, uh, just carry on and break uh, these agreements left, right and centre, whilst pointing the, the, the finger at, at China uh, for doing so. When, you know, we're breaking the inter the uh, UN law of the sea uh, with, uh, the, they made a ruling on the Chagos Islands, uh, which we've just uh, brushed aside. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. Mm. Can I just come in there, Ellie, because I just see that Anne has made another comment saying that the local Tory MP says he's not happy about the increase. And actually, it's, it is quite interesting um, how the opposition to the warhead increase has been quite uh, broad. Um, and there are various military people and so on who've um, come out against it as well. You know, so it's it's not just a kind of peace mix opposition. It's it's quite broad and wide across society. Uh, well, we do. I think there's a few more questions coming in, but I think if we move on to uh, our, our next panelist, and then there will be time for um, questions after that as well. So, um, but please do continue popping your questions in in the Q and A function, and we'll see those later. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Dave Webb. Uh, Dave is Chair of CND, uh, Vice President of the uh, International Peace Bureau um, and Convener of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. Um, and he's here to discuss UK space policy and the contribution that the Integrated Review has um, on the militarisation of space. Thank you very much. Sorry. Um, uh, if I can just share my screen, I've got a few slides to show. Um, does that work OK? Right. Um, yeah, thank you for asking me to speak on this because it's quite uh, an important part. I mean, Kate's obviously outlined and Jenny um, some huge uh, bad points about this integrated review and another one that kind of doesn't get so much airing really is the space issue uh, and this is something that's been going on for quite a while uh, the developments in space um, but they're kind of generally not taken much uh, notice of I guess by the media or by um, many kind of uh, peace groups really so this is a, an important time to highlight these things um, I'm going to show some slides because some of the pictures may emphasize that many of them are taken from doc government documents. So you may not even be aware that these government documents exist, um, but they do. So uh, basically the, um, the integrated review has two, um, two specific statements which highlight two major factors. The first one is that uh, the government wants to, to develop a dynamic space program. Uh, and the purpose of this will be to project power, as um, Kate has already said and highlighted, and so has Jenny really too. It's about power projection, and that where better to project power from than from space, because you can cover the whole globe that way. Uh, the second statement there highlighted is, we will make the UK a meaningful actor in space with an integrated space strategy, which brings together military and civil space policy. So in other words, the policy will bring together the military aspirations for space together with the civil space um, commercial interests in, in space. And this isn't new. There have been dual use kind of uh, satellites and so on, space activities for a long, a long time now. But this kind of shows how deeply entrenched that, that whole idea is now in, in government policy. So how are they going to bring the commercial and military interests together? Well, the UK Space, which is the trade association of the British space industry, and the RAF have already established a commercial integration cell at the MOD Space Operations Centre 
in High Wycombe to work on programmes that jointly serve commercial and military interests. So that's already there. The military, the civil military collaboration has already begun uh, in the past as well as a while ago in 2008, the government awarded Surrey Satellite Technology Limited, which is owned by Air, Airbus Defence and Space, started off as a university based um, research and the technology development uh, uh, project and now is developed into this big a uh, much bigger company, they specialize in, in, in developing mini satellites, small satellites that are easy to launch and uh, relatively easy to, to put together. So th they got four million, over four million pounds to develop a small low orbit satellite, which was launched in 2018 to provide high resolution reconnaissance for MOD intelligence gathering. Uh, this also then this project evolved into something much bigger into something called Artemis, which was a project led by the RAF with Airbus with uh, with the Surrey um, Satellite Technology Limited with Raytheon, the huge US Aerospace Corporation, uh, the US government and Virgin Orbit uh, were all partners in this Artemis project, you can see the um, kind of you know poster for it there. Uh, and another major factor also emerges in the statement that uh, by two, 2030, the government is to have or wants to have the UK to the ability to monitor, protect and defend our interests in and through space by a mixture of capabilities through sovereign capabilities and burden sharing partnerships. In other words, to develop our home based systems, but also to share with others to 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 go cooperate be more cooperative with other partners. And the National Space Council is to develop this strategy um, in this year. It hasn't done so yet, hasn't been published yet. But um, uh, these, the, one of the items that they, they want to do is to establish uh, a new space command to, do, to advance UK interest in earth and space and enhance cooperation. They also want to develop a commercial launch capability and you can see on this map which is produced by, from the government uh, documents that they want to produce or try to put in space ports these space ports in different parts of the country uh, four in scotland to one in wales and one in the uk um, more of those in a moment but they also be able to launch british satellites from scotland by by next year in fact uh, They've employed already Lockheed Martin to investigate possible spaceports, those ones that you just saw. They've chosen Lockheed Martin themselves, have chosen the Isle of Unst in the Shetland Islands to develop a space center for them for military operations. Uh, that will be, um, that, that's kind of stuttered a little bit because of objections to it. They've all had objections to it, but this one's, uh, we can say more about that later on. Um, they've also got, uh, they've also recommended somewhere in the Highlands in Sutherland, County Sutherland, and also in uh, the island of um, Skolpeg in North Uist. There's two other possibilities. This is their proposed space centre on Unst. They're all by the sea because these vertical takeoff rockets sometimes go wrong. And if they do, they can be, they can crash into the sea rather than on, on, on land. Uh, two other spaceports are also planned for horizontal launches, that is launches from aircraft, aircraft takeoff carrying the particular component for space and then it's launched higher up in the uh, higher altitudes. And they are at Presswick and Argyle, there's also some based for um, Snowdonia in, in Wales and also Cornwall in, in England. Um, the, the space strategy will also look to develop capabilities for the military and civil use, including this idea of space domain awareness, that is becoming aware of what the background, the environment is in space in, for various reasons, for most of, or a lot of them being military. Um, and also to support, the, the UK wants to support the space sector to realise the economic benefits. So what are these economic benefits? Now actually space is seen as a potential past, path to recovery or one of the potential paths for recovery from the disastrous economic situation caused by COVID. And the space business is, 
reckoned to be worth over a trillion dollars by 2040, the government has said it wants 10% of that market by 2030. Whether that will happen or not is not clear. But the one way of trying to get this uh, into operation is a consortium of local enterprise partnerships, which are establishing several regional space hubs, which we've seen uh, the space ports, these are space hubs around the UK to ensure space is a priority for regional economic growth. Uh, you can see a list here of those, those that have already received funding or, or for this. Uh, they're spread all over the country. Um, we can say more about those later if you wish. In Scotland, you can also see um, this is uh, something that appears from the Scottish Leadership Council's Twitter and LinkedIn pay, uh, sites. And many of the companies involved here, these are the companies that they want to try to get involved. Many of them are uh, military companies, well known for their aerospace, military aerospace activities. And there's also some departments from Scottish universities as well. So the, the space strategy will also look to prevent the pro pro proliferation of technologies that pose a threat in space. It doesn't say exactly how they're gonna do that. Uh, and increase the UK's international collaboration. They want to deepen cooperation with NATO by the combined, so-called Combined Space Operations Initiative and also develop work with NASA and the European, Canadian, Australian and Japanese space agencies. So all of this international collaboration, mainly to save money, but also to be part of my, um, something that's much bigger. And already the UK Space Command is participating in the US-led space coalition called Operation Olympic Defender. The UK has access through this to the, U the US standardized astrodynamics algorithm library, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it basically means they share information between the participants in this particular operation. Uh, and that gives them more ways of which in which they can streamline multinational military operations around the world. So we're part of this military global operation that's basically headed by the United States. Another two things, work with NATO, continue to work with NATO allies to ensure a united response to Russia, mainly, it doesn't mention that, but that's what it hints at, and support closer cooperation between NATO and the EU, which are supposed to be separate bodies, of course and contribute to missile defense, to space awareness, uh, and resilience to CBRN resilience. So we've got also, of course, in this country, in Yorkshire, um, the two bases at Finingdales here, the radar at Finingdales, and the spy base at Menworth Hill, which is also a downlink for US missile defense. So these two bases are going to be focused yet again on our collaboration with the US for missile defense. Finally, just uh, to say one thing, it's not mentioned so much in the, uh, in the actual report itself, but the UK's fleet of armed drones depends on satellites for communication and control. And this service is soon to be supplied by the UK Skynet system. At the moment, it's, uh, it works through US and commercial satellite systems, but they want to move this onto the UK Skynet system, which is now already being expanded for military and commercial use. So that gives a kind of a, I think, fairly broad, but somewhat detailed, um, a little bit detailed there into what, uh, what the government wants to do in space. And none of it's particularly, well, none of it's particularly good. Um, so maybe it's time to take the UK's role in the militarization of space seriously. And I think we should certainly do that. We should certainly start opposing these moves before it's too late. The US has already dominated space with military um, systems, we don't want to be part of that. So thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you for that, Dave. I, I always find that the space element of, of defense like mildly terrifying. I feel like the more I learn about it, the more I just rather not. <laughs> um, so we've got a couple of questions have come in. There's been a bit of conversation about media and analysis. Uh, so, so Jackie mentioning that the uh, aircraft carrier was mentioned on Radio 4 today, um, but without any kind of alternative viewpoints or any kind of critique of what this might, what this might look like on an international uh, level. Um, and additionally, we've got a, a question in from 
uh, Ray Street saying um, that Russia, the Russian foreign minister has picked up on the fact that Western countries are not respecting international law, um, interestingly. Um, and has sort of questioned how we could potentially get more coverage of this in, in the media. So I suppose this, this could link into two questions on, on a wider level, how, how do we bring more attention to this? And I also think on a local level, you know, getting people involved with their own local media and their own conversations around this um, in their press. So I don't know if anyone wants to come in on either of those. But also do keep the questions coming in, everyone else. Um, yeah, Jenny, go for it. Um, yes, uh, so in response to Rave, uh, very interesting and important points here. Um, when uh, Biden talks about the coalition, uh, sorry, when Biden talks about the summit of democracies and the G7 summit, uh, which is being held in June, is, is shaping up uh, as a summit of democracies, um, I always think that the origins of this are in the coalition of the willing that launched the Iraq war. Uh, and of course, this coalition was set up precisely to um, um, uh, against the UN, which was at, because they felt they couldn't get a resolution through the UN on the Iraq war. So this is really the, a development uh, that the, these are developments that, that uh, you know, uh, were initiated um, you know, some 20 years ago. So I think that they're important points. And I'd also like to raise something with Dave, because I think that, uh, you know, setting out what is uh, all of these uh, space ports and, and launching, uh, I don't know how many satellites are going to be all over space and the possibilities of collision, let alone, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the kind of, uh, anti-satellite um, uh, technologies uh, is really all increasing the uh, prospects of space, a war in space. And um, I think that a lot of it is uh, actually about China, although you highlight Russia, because after all, China is racing ahead uh, in space technologies. Um, and when we talk about space wars and the danger of space wars, I think it's very important to highlight how both Russia and China for years and years and years have been putting forward proposals for the prevention of an arms race in space and for the peaceful use of space. And this has been consistently obstructed. I mean, this was under the UN, again, the UN conference uh, for disarmament, which is maybe what Lavrov was referring to here. Um, and uh, the uh, United States and the UK uh, have uh, simply obstructed uh, this treaty. So again, uh, you know, this is not about a UN rules-based order, it's actually about uh, an order that is made uh, with where the rules are made mainly by the US. If, if I could just co comment on that. Yeah, that, that's quite right. Um, Russia and China have put forward these resolutions continuously every year for, for many years now on the prevention of an arms race in outer space. Actually, the, the UK has voted in favour of that a number of times. Sometimes they abstain, sometimes they vote against. I guess it depends who's in government uh, and what's going on there. But um, generally speaking, the UK has supported that more, more often than not. But there are no rules uh, as such in space. As, as you say, there are a couple of treaties like the uh, Outer Space Treaty, but all that does in terms of weapons in space is to prevent the stationing of weapons of mass destruction, which is something, but uh, there's nothing to stop other types of weapons being stationed in space at the moment. So those talks are stymied by the US and by a couple of other uh, com countries that very often, in fact, including Israel usually, uh, who votes against that, uh, that particular move to prevent an arms race in outer space. Um, I think somebody asked whether the Labour Party has a, a policy on the military use of space. As far as I know, it doesn't. Uh, I don't know that any policy, uh, party has uh, particularly. It's going to be quite difficult persuading some of the local politicians. Already the poli local politicians in Scotland are all in favour of these um, spaceports because they keep being told 
they're bringing lots of money, they're bringing lots of jobs, uh, and so on. And that's the usual kind of thing you get with, with these sorts of uh, facilities, if you can call them that. But, but other, as other countries have found abroad, that doesn't always happen. The, the, the people that are required to operate these things come from outside. They don't come from the local inhabitation. Uh, and also uh, the money doesn't come in as much as is being promised. You've only got to have one accident at one of these things and it can set the whole thing back for, for years. So, you know, people should be aware of the, of the dangers that uh, they may be faced with. Thank you for that. I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on the point on the on Labour Party policy. I did enjoy Linda's little caveat that we would all be appreciative of any policy coming out of Labour Party at the moment. Um, and uh, we've got another question in from Jackie, who has asked, how do the developments in Scotland fit in with devolution? Um, don't know if you want to take that, Dave. Well, that's a really good question. I, I don't know. I mean, that would be interesting. Um, I, at the moment, they want uh, Scotland, the, those islands up in Scotland, because they're high latitude. They're in a high latitude position. And that means they can launch satellites from there into a specific kind of polar orbits. You know, it's easier to, to put them into those kind of orbits. And those orbits are very useful for military and commercial purposes, for uh, communications, and for surveillance, things like that. So because they cover the whole, the, as the Earth spins underneath the orbit, it covers the whole globe within an hour and a half or so. So um, uh, it, yes, I don't know. I mean, I, that, I guess that's why they're probably looking at other spaceports elsewhere as well, but it would be interesting. They'd probably be, I guess, making some arrangement where they could still use the spaceports, even if there was uh, devolution. But it's a good, it's an interesting point. And it's also an interesting point that the uh, Scottish uh, National Party are actually supporting the development of some of these spaceports. So we should really uh, do more work with them on, uh, uh, you know, what are the disadvantages of these things, what they're letting themselves in for. Mm. Can I just come in there early about the, the Scottish question? Um, just going back to the kind of broader, broader issue about Trident, because of course with the, um, recent elections in Scotland. Again, it was coming up about um, if Scotland becomes independent, and you know we, we can see um, a, a further referendum coming down the road. You know, in the not too distant future, presumably, and it does once again open up the whole question: if Scotland becomes independent and decides that they don't want to uh, house Trident, um, then what? You know, then where will it go you know and it, it brings us back to the whole question then um, the late john ainsley wrote the fantastic pamphlet trident nowhere to go looking at all the different options you know and it and it really does very seriously raise the question if there's an independent scotland which puts trident out then then what will happen you know and that's something that we need to to look at again you know when we have to defeat trident not only in Scotland, and I think that's pretty much a done deal in Scotland in terms of defeating the case for Trident and Trident replacement, but we have to defeat that in England too, you know, and in the Westminster Parliament, which is um, a more complex problem, not least because of um, the policies of the larger parties. You know, someone made the comment about, as Anne, I think, about Labour's policy on space wars. Well, you know, what about Labour's policy on Trident? We need to uh, do work on that. Oh, uh, well, I know a lot of you who are in the Labour Party have been trying to do work on that for a long time. But, you know, these are issues that are coming back and they're really, really live issues, you know, and, and there are big opportunities there for us as well as big challenges. And I think that brings us to a really, really good place to end on. Um, so firstly, I want to say a massive thank you to each of our speakers. Uh, you've all been fantastic, as always. Um, and a really big thank you to Greater Manchester DND for putting this on. Um, if you want to make sure that you catch all of the events like this in the future, you can sign up to Greater Manchester DND's uh, newsletter on the website um, or just keep an eye on Facebook and all that. Um, and then I think that is all from us. 
So have a lovely evening and look after yourself. Um, and thanks for coming. Thanks, Ellie. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.